Okay, so just want to wish a good evening to everyone who's here so far. We may have a little bit, a um, few people trickling in within the next few minutes. So if I stop talking momentarily, it's probably just to admit more people. Um, my name is Ryan Jurley. I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator with the Muskinet Kong Watershed Association. And we will be um, hosting this talk tonight on streamside landscaping and, and with a focus on, on native plants, native to New Jersey. So um, for those of you who aren't familiar um, with the Muskinet Kong Watershed Association or our River Talk series, I will give a little introduction. Um, we, the MWA, are an independent nonprofit organization dedicated to protecting and improving the quality of the Muskinet Kong River and its surrounding watershed, uh, which includes both natural and cultural resources. So um, the environment, the ecosystem, but also the, the communities and the people that, that live around this. So we want all of that to thrive. And so we try to find ways to, to work together on that. Um, acknowledging that we're all part of the same system, knowing that our actions on the land do affect the quality of the river. So we pursue this mission through a number of means. Uh, we have volunteer and professional level water quality monitoring. Uh, we have education programs. We have uh, sort of, we get involved with um, outreach and recreation. So we'll work with um, municipalities to um, help them understand new regulations or, or managing different environmental issues in their communities. Uh, we lead hikes, we lead paddling trips. So we get involved in a lot of different ways of getting people outside as well. Um, and we also always try to, to fight for the river, um, even if that comes into the policy sense. Um, so uh, with that being said, um, a lot of the work that gets done um, it's done with the help of volunteers. And so um, I also manage the volunteer program. So I'm always um, going to take up an opportunity to plug that. If, if any of this sounds interesting to you, um, any of these activities, uh, chances are there's a way for you to get involved if you want. So you can always uh, reach out to us, reach out to me specifically if you have questions or interest about volunteering. Because um, we, oh my gosh, we have a lot of cool activities coming up this spring and summer whether you want to get outside or, or just do something uh, to help our cause. So um, getting back to, to this talk specifically, um, this River Talk series, we try to do it monthly. It's just a, a public engagement. Uh, we try to bring in guest speakers who can speak on topics of interest to people who live near the river, or enjoy the river, or just enjoy our local outdoor spaces. Um, so this is one such talk. Hope that as the weather gets warmer, we'll be able to um, host some of these outside, have some of these um, not only in person, but more hands-on as well. Um, but tonight, I think this is a topic that lends itself well to the setting. So um, as I said at the beginning, this is on streamside landscaping. And so we'll be talking about uh, the vegetated areas along riverbanks known as riparian buffers and the benefits that they provide not only to the water quality of streams, but also wildlife and people who might live along the river. Uh, the Muskinet Kong Watershed Association has been actively involved with um, restoration of environments, including planting trees and, and other plants that thrive along the river. And we, can, we plan to continue that work uh, over the next year, year and a half, as we do have uh, some programs and projects that are, uh, fall into that arena. And so um, we hope through this talk, you'll learn about the benefits of native streamside landscaping and how to choose plants that are suitable for your property. Uh, and if you don't live along the river, that's cool too, because a lot of this will uh, end up pertaining to your efforts. So um, we'll talk about what we call the multifunctional benefits of these buffers, um, whether it's improving habitat for wildlife and pollinators, whether it's finding plants that you can eat or use for medicine, uh, use for floral arrangements, or just you want something that looks really nice and colorful all year long. Um, so we have a, a couple of speakers who are going to help us with that tonight. Annie Polkowski is uh, the Watershed Programs Coordinator here at the Muskinet Kong Watershed Association. And she primarily leads projects that help restore and protect the Muskinet Kong and the streams that feed it. These projects include planning stream restoration, uh, dam removals, 
uh, and riparian buffer plantings. So on top of her passions uh, for this watershed and water quality in general, general, Annie shares a love of gardening and plants passed down from her mom and her grandmother. And as a result, she enjoys sharing her knowledge of native plants and landscaping and incorporating them into her own gardening efforts. So Annie will be leading us, but we also have support from Tomas Gonzalez, who um, is a MWA board member. Uh, he's also a self-taught naturalist and the designer of the national award-winning Karen Nash Memorial Butterfly Garden located in Washington, New Jersey, um, the one that's in Warren County, not Morris County. Uh, Tomas has been the project manager of the garden since its inception 25 years ago, and his lifelong interest in the flora and fauna of his native New Jersey has been the impetus for his ongoing work in environmental education. So uh, having known these people personally, I can say that um, there's going to be a lot of shared knowledge uh, between these two, and, and judging by some of those who are in attendance, I think we'll also have a, a very good discussion. So feel free to leave questions in, in the chat box. Um, may touch on them throughout the presentation. We may hold them to the end. It all depends on, on how it goes. But at the very least, we'll have discussion time at the end. So um, Annie, I will uh, stop talking myself and, and leave it up to you. You can uh, share your screen and we can right. get started. All right, thank you, Ryan, for that introduction. Let me get my screen share going. Okay, can you all see the, the presentation before I get going? Good. Okay. All right, thanks guys. Um, so like Ryan said, um, I wanted to talk about uh, the streamside landscaping um, concept um, and program that we are um, leading this this spring um, through this this entire year, um, we have been uh, successfully awarded grant funding um, to assist with what we call streamside landscaping or riparian buffers. Um, so this is, you know, going to be kind of an introductory talk to that concept, why these streamside areas are so important, and then you know, hope to engage with you all. Um, as well as the larger community about this project and you know, what we might be able to um, assist you with in your own planting endeavors. So this talk was um, titled Streamside Landscaping for Water and for People. Um, so like Ryan said, most of my work um, with the MWA is focused about uh, or focused on restoration projects primarily to promote water quality, um, but you know, we, in every project that we do, we recognize that um, there is a personal component to that project. And as much as possible, we like to engage, you know, with the needs and the, the wants of the landowners that we're working with. Um, so I wanted to spend a little bit more time today um, focusing on that aspect of things. You know, what, what can you get out of these um, streamside landscaping areas or repairing buffers, as we like to call them. Um, and, you know, how can you find enjoyment in these places? Okay, so here's just a couple of um, key takeaways that I'd like to cover in this talk. Um, you know, getting a little bit more out of it than, than just a technical presentation on, you know, how to plant these repairing buffers or why native, native plants, et cetera. Um, so I really wanna dig into understanding um, why these streamside areas are sensitive places in our ecosystem and are important areas to consider um, in our landscaping choices. Um, also to start thinking about getting more intentional about our, lands, our gardening and our landscaping choices. You know, what impact do we have on our landscape even if we only live on you know, a tiny quarter acre property, um, you know, we, we all have an impact. Um, I'd like us to connect more with our um, environment and find enjoyment in nature. So, you know, like I said, these are our personal places. I find an escape in nature um, and, you know, bringing some of that home, you know, can be, you can find a lot of enjoyment out of that. And then also, um, how can we integrate more diversity and native plants into our own backyard? So what do I mean by uh, streamside landscapes and why are they important? Um, 
Streamside la landscapes, also known as riparian zones, are the transitional areas between a water body and land. Um, so this can be the transition zone between a stream or a creek or a river, um, but we can also think about water bodies such as ponds, lakes, um, wetlands, even, you know, we think about drainage swales, those all, um, you know, we can think about similar concepts in all of these zones. Um, these are all ecologically important um, zones subject to additional stresses such as erosion and are critical areas to protecting our water resources. So like Ryan said, riparian buffers is the more technical term for describing these zones. And the definition is um, vegetated areas near a stream, usually forested, which help to shade and partially protect the stream from the impacts of adjacent land uses. All right, so first I'll just touch on some of the benefits to water. Um, riparian buffer zones are really critical zones for helping us to filter out pollutants from stormwater runoff, you know, pesticides, fertilizers that we apply to our lawns, um, uh, soil erosion. These are all different pollutants that can affect our water bodies and having a buffer between um, our water source and, and those upland land uses helps us to filter out these uh, potential pollutants. Um, these areas are also critical for prevention of stream bank erosion. I'll talk about that a little bit more, um, but the vegetation along these stream side areas, really the roots help to knit together these stream banks um, reducing the impacts of stream bank erosion when we have, you know, bigger storm events come through. They also provide important habitat and shade to aquatic life. Um, so this is really critical for many of our native aquatic organisms, you know, native trout are highly dependent on cold, clean water. Um, so the shade from these vegetated areas um, plays a critical role in providing that um, to their habitat. And then, of course, you know, protecting our floodplains and mitigate the impacts of flooding. Um, many of these riparian zones can slow down floodwaters um, and provide an area for more water infiltration during these storm events, helping to reduce, you know, the downstream impacts of flooding on our infrastructure. And then, what about the benefits to people? Um, these these riparian areas um, can provide habitat to our native wildlife. Um, much of it that you know you may enjoy um, attracting to your your own properties. Um, they can attract and support beneficial insects and pollinators. Um, you know we all have heard about um, the importance of pollinators and you know how many of our our pollinators are being decimated. Um, so these areas provide an opportunity to introduce more plants to support them. Um, there may be opportunities for native edible and medicinal plants. Um, so we can find other ways to utilize these riparian areas um, and some of the plants that we choose for them. Um, and then of course, provide opportunities to enjoy our own property. Um, Tomas will go into this a little bit on his own property later in the presentation, but, you know, there are many opportunities to create um, beautiful, lower maintenance, native, what I like to call ecoscapes for enjoying your own property. So one of the biggest issues we see um, with streamside areas that lack a riparian buffer is the issue of stream bank erosion. Um, this can result in loss of property and even uh, potential impacts to nearby infrastructure. And one of the biggest reasons that, you know, many of these areas see increased erosion on these stream banks is because there's um, traditionally uh, turf grasses that, you know, we use in our, our lawn, um, they have very little root mass. So here's just a quick description or a quick infographic showing the the depth of the root mass of our traditional turf grasses versus some of our native um, native grasses. You can see just how 
much deeper and more extensive those root systems are that help to really hold together those stream bank areas. So here's what I mean um, talking about stream bank erosion, um, especially when we only vegetate these areas with cool season turf grasses. Um, there's very little holding that bank together and over time um, that will be subject to more and more erosion. <clears throat> Um, so what do we consider when we're choosing plants um, for your streamside landscape? The first one is obviously the proximity to the source of water. So um, whether that be right on the bank of a stream or moving outward um, from that bank of the stream, you know, you may have different zones of increasing wetness. Um, those areas may also be more or less subject to occasional flooding that you have to th think about when selecting plants. Um, of course, soil qualities are very important when selecting any plants. Um, and there are many online resources to help you determine what type of soils you have on your property. But some big ones are the soil drainage. So do you have like a sandy loamy soil that, um, you know, water may infiltrate through rather quickly, or do you have a more clay-based soil that water is going to tend to pond um, and hang out longer? Um, the texture, of course, is very important. Like I said, that sandy soil versus clay soil, um, you know, different plants will thrive in, in different types of soil and soil pH. Um, check out for signs of frequent erosion along those banks. So oftentimes um, you'll see more erosion around the outer bend of, of a stream or a river. So those are um, more critical areas to protect with um, you know, stronger rootstock. Um, so that may be an area that you want to plant with um, some deeper rooted shrubbery or trees. Um, also check out your available or available light um, and existing canopy cover. So um, many plants, um, you know, have differing light needs. So do you have a more sunny land landscape or you know more shade? So and that would impact what plants you would select. Um, similar to looking out for signs of frequent erosion is also to check out areas. Um, that have signs of erosion and have um, some drainage patterns on the landscape. So these may also be areas that are more subject to erosion that you may wanna consider some um, deeper rooted plants. And then of course, um, investigating any um, existing uh, plants on your property. So do you have an issue with invasive plants that you may have to remove from the property prior to a planting? Or you know, can you get some clues about the, the types of plants that thrive on your property that are native? So what else can we consider when we're designing these landscapes? So textures, colors, blooms, and seasonal interest. Um, again, the ability to attract wildlife to your property like songbirds. Um, the ability to attract pollinators and other beneficial insects potential for you know, different edible medicinal plants, woody flowers for cut um, flower arrangements. Um, many people are you know, exploring that hobby, especially with the pandemic, um, you know, utilizing your own native species and, and bringing that nature inside. Um, and then you know, thinking also, how can we create low impact spaces for people in nature. So um, one of the biggest concerns I have heard um, is, you know, people are afraid to install a riparian buffer or do any sort of um, landscaping alongside a stream or a river because they're afraid to lose that view. But there are alternatives to creating interesting um, places for, for people in those zones. Um, but, you know, what are, what are some options um, for creating some more low impact um, ways to enjoy that, that area. <laughs> All right, so um, 
just touching on some uh, different native plants. Um, you know, many, many people who are unfamiliar with um, our native plants may, may not be familiar with um, just the, the, the depth of um, color, bloom, texture, just different varieties um, that we have um, native to this area. Um, one palette of um, plants you may consider is, you know, creating a space that has lots of seasonal fall interest. So I've just highlighted here some different plants that um, have really beautiful fall colors. Um, you know, many, many um, traditional like landscape nurseries, you may find like, you know, different burning bush varieties that are um, in, they're beautiful, but they are actually invasive species and um, not beneficial to our landscape. There are many native alternatives to those types of planting. So for example, high bush blueberry is got this beautiful fall um, red color. Um, red twig dogwood is one of my favorite riparian plants. So in the wintertime, it actually um, loses, it has a lime green, um, foliage, um, but in the wintertime, it's just stunning with this red um, color on its stems. Um, silky dogwood is another favorite of mine. Um, I love the color of the, the berries. Um, red maple, of course, that does well in these riparian areas. Um, and oak leaf hydrangea, so many people are familiar with, um, you know, non-native cultivars of hydrangea, but we actually do have some native um, species of hydrangea that are quite beautiful come fall. So there are other reasons to think about seasonality too. So um, seasonal um, interest, thinking about this when we're doing our plant selection um, can both enhance our gardens aesthetically as well as um, ecologically. So I'm just, uh, this is actually skunk cabbage, which is a non-traditional choice. Um, for, you know, gardening per se, but this is actually a pretty interesting native plant species, um, considering it is one of the earliest um, spring ephemerals, um, and it supports many of those very early um, pollinator species. So um, this was actually something that I, I found on a hike recently, so just wanted to throw that in there. You know, I'm, I am a gardener um, and I love seeing that first pop of spring. So, you know, surprisingly skunk cabbage is one of my, my favorites, but thinking about the seasonality of the plants that we're selecting um, and how they can provide, um, you know, a food source throughout the year to, to our wildlife is also an important consideration. So that segues nicely into um, the next um, benefit is the ability to attract um, various species of wildlife. So I wanted to talk a little bit about birds. Um, many of our uh, native songbirds, um, you know, they we can attract them to our landscapes uh, utilizing native plants. So a, a diversity of these native plants provides a food source for many, many native songbirds. Um, and native plants also do a much better job at hosting native insects, um, such as butterflies and moths. Um, this is actually a primary food for um, many native birds. Um, so when we're thinking about, you know, how can we attract more wildlife to our, our landscapes, oftentimes it's not so much about, you know, which plant is going to be the best. It's about the variety of plants that you can offer. So um, my, my very basic equation here, um, more plant species plus more plant structural diversity. So thinking about your ground covers, thinking about trees, thinking about grasses, shrubs, um, and more habitat connectivity um, can all equal um, increased wildlife to your properties. Um, another favorite speaker of mine, um, and I'm sure some of you on this call have listened to his talks, is Doug Tallamy. Um, and some of his, uh, his research is actually focused on uh, larval um, 
you know, moths and butterflies and which native species support them. So um, surprisingly, our oak species are incredibly important to um, our native ecosystems. Um, they can support over 500 um, different um, native butterflies and moths. Whereas if we compare that to say invasive um, or not, not invasive, but non-native tree species like ginkgo, um, they can only support about seven um, different species of butterflies and moths. So these are all very important um, for thinking about birds in our landscape. So, you know, many of us may have bird feeders, um, hummingbird feeders out um, to attract birds, but a substantial portion of their diet is actually the insects um, in our landscape. So if we can introduce more species um, to support the, the native insects, we can encourage more wildlife to our properties. Um, so trees may not be everybody's um, preference when they are selecting species for riparian buffer, like I mentioned before. Um, some people are, you know, they do want to maintain a little bit of a view of their, their streamside landscaping. So I wanted to just bring up the fact that um, our native grasses and uh, our native warm season grasses can provide excellent habitat for many important um, wildlife species. So these warm season grasses, they can provide um, cover and um, nesting habitat for many native birds. Um, and they do an excellent job at protecting water quality because of their, their dense deep root systems and also the dense biomass, um, you know, that is growing vertically that can help to filter out um, pollutants from entering the stream. So while they may not provide um, uh, excellent shade cover, they, they do serve a place in our landscape and are important to highlight. So um, just a couple different species here. Um, this is actually a, a field of little um, blue stem grass, one, one native species. And then um, a native switchgrass actually has some beautiful um, red uh, color to it in the fall. Um, and like I said, these can pro provide important um, cover areas to our native wildlife. So just a couple of uh, resources to check out if you're especially interested in birds in the landscape and um, supporting wildlife in the landscape. We have um, Audubon Society. Um, we do have a New Jersey chapter of Audubon Society. I did actually pull this from the PA chapter, um, but it has you know, very similar habitat um, and native species to New Jersey. Um, but this is the Audubon creates this birdie dozen of um, streamside edition of native plants that support um, that support water quality and also support habitat for birds. And then I really also like this Jersey Friendly Yards um, website um, provides a, a wonderful plant database and talks about, you know, some of the benefits to um, to wildlife and how we can create beneficial wildlife habitat in our yards. Okay, moving on to the next palette. Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about um, the benefits to pollinators. So um, really the diversity is key again here in supporting our native pollinators. Um, pollinator buffers can provide plenty of opportunity for um, hosting a variety of different colors um, with very showy blooms. Oftentimes when we think of these pollinator gardens, we think of the summertime blooms. Um, and you know, just this beautiful palette of, of color here. Um, but we also wanna remember that, you know, um, diversity is key and um, many flowering trees and spring ephemerals um, can help to support pollinators throughout the growing season. So just a couple here to highlight um, some beautiful native plants. Um, that are excellent on these riparian areas. Um, you know, we've got the Blazing Star, um, Big Leaf Aster, and New York Ironweed. 
um, on this beautiful purple color. Um, mountain mint is also a favorite of um, many pollinators. Um, swamp milkweed, um, of course, our milkweed species are critical for supporting monarch butterflies. Um, and then showy goldenrod is another um, uh, really beautiful plant that we can consider in our streamside landscapes. I did want to quickly just touch on the importance of native pollinators. So, you know, I'm sure all of us have heard about the importance of pollinators um, and the importance of honeybees, for example. Um, but, you know, this is, it, it's really important to fully understand um, what role they play in both our ecosystem as well as our food security. So here's just um, an example of strawberry. Um, this was uh, the, the full strawberry here. This is actually insect pollinated, um, but the other two strawberries, um, the next one over is um, wind pollinated. And then the third one is self pollinated. So you can just see that, you know, the insect pollination is really crucial to, you know, growing most of our food um, that support us. So, um, so about 75% of North American plant species do require insect pollination um, to move the pollen from one plant to the other for effective pollen pollination. Um, and this isn't just, um, honeybees. The, in North America, there's over 4,000 native bee species, um, and 20 to 45 percent of those species are actually um, pollen specialists, meaning that they um, have specific host plants um, that they support. For example, um, much of our squashes and pumpkins um, sunflowers, those are all pollinated by um, specialist native um, bee species. Um, and then of course there are many other pollinators including um, native butterflies and moths, flies, bats, beetles, wasps. Um, it's really critical to think about all of these species um, when we're thinking about planting for pollinators um, in our landscapes. So another interesting idea um, about, you know, riparian planting or streamside planting is the opportunity to create um, native food forests um, that can provide interesting edible or medicinal plants for people and for wildlife. So this is actually a picture of, it's not the most interesting picture, but it is a project that I recently worked on um, for riparian planting. Um, this was done on a native or on an organic berry farm. So she was growing primarily blackberries for sale at a farmer's market, but she wanted to expand her business into providing um, a different variety of uh, native edible plants. And her property was located right along a streamside area. So we went through and we selected a variety of um, edible plants that, you know, she has begun to market. So just a couple of those species, um, you know, that you may or may not be aware of um, that are edible. Um, so we've got shadbush or service berry. Um, elderberry, of course, is um, both edible and um, has medicinal properties to it. Highbush blueberry, again, um, pawpaw, if you have not tasted a pawpaw yet, they're um, very interesting. They, they taste almost like a cross between a mango and a banana, um, but it is, you know, like a native, almost tropical fruit. So um, I very much want to have some pawpaws um, planted along the musky at some point. Um, spice bush is actually interesting. So, um, you know, spice bush, much like the name, um, hints to how this is used. So you can actually dry the berries on a spice bush plant and grind them like um, peppercorns. So that's actually what many um, people um, in this area had done up until, you know, mass availability of, of pepper. Um, and then American plum. 
All right. Um, and then just another um, concept or idea for, you know, providing interest to these riparian areas is the idea of um, potential for um, cut flower arrangements and um, especially these woody cut stems. Um, so more and more, um, you know, farmers, gardeners, um, and hobbyists, you know, they're, they're starting to get interested in um, arranging cut flowers, bringing them into their own home. Um, and there is actually market developed for these um, types of species. So um, some really common ones that you would see pussy willow um, is one type of uh, cut floral arrange, um, flower that you can um, even take to market. Um, of course, winterberry, um, that is what you primarily find in like Christmas seasonal arrangements. Common nine bark um, also provides some interesting um, uh, material for floral arrangements and, and witch hazel. All right, so I'm just gonna hand it over then um, to Tomas. Um, and he's going to be talking a little bit about his own landscape and, you know, how he has incorporated um, native planting um, into his streamside property. Great. Well, I was going to use my uh, yard, my personal yard, as a, a case uh, study, not so much as a uh, uh, to, to set it off as a, as exemplary in any way, but just it's what what sort of led me to uh, the point where I'm at now. When I first moved into my house, um, as Annie mentioned, you know the whole idea is to look around and see what you've got growing in your environment, be aware of your environment. So I didn't touch anything for a year because the owner had planted various kinds of shrubs, and I had no idea what was there. I live along the Pohacon Creek, so um, you know what 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 was growing along the stream also informed me the types of trees we have. For instance, uh, black gum growing along the the Pohat, and various kinds of uh, shrub dogwoods and and black walnuts and other trees and things like that. And so, I think uh, a good starting point. You know, you can consider the soil, you can look at lists of plants, but the best thing you can do is actually go outside and look at, at your environment or wherever you're planting and see what's already there. And that will inform you. Um, I'm gonna start, I don't know why I've got this double image here. Yeah, Tomas, do you want me to click to, this is- Just the, just the first one would, would do with the, uh, the front of the house and then the side garden, will, I guess. I don't know. It's it's disorienting for me. So. Um, okay, I've got like two pictures. I don't know what everybody else sees. I've got yeah. Two everybody pictures. sees two pictures. I grouped okay. them together. Well, the pictures sort of. Well, we're looking. All right. Well, let's go back to the first one. This is just an area, just to give you an idea. In, in the front of my house, um, I planted the dogwood tree that you see standing there, and this is a relatively small area, relatively recently developed. I only planted this about four years ago. So I want to use this as an example of, you know, it, it, it's going to take time if you're going to plant trees. I mean, the tree itself was planted probably 25 years ago, but the, uh, the plants below it were about four or five years ago, and it's filled in rather nicely. Um, I'm just pointing this out because it's a shady area, and it's not a very large area, but it's extremely enjoyable. I mean, because it, it's right where you you walked into my house, the front in front of the house. I have a, a setup where that second picture is is uh, showing. Um, I've got a coffee table outside. So you, I sit there and I can enjoy it. I can look up the road to see who's coming. I can actually look over and, and see the creek. But if you look at this, this small area, it's very diverse in terms of its uh, content. Um, it's got uh, a variety of, of native ferns. It's got uh, ostrich fern. It's got cinnamon fern. It's got maidenhair fern. It's got also non-native species like the spotted plants uh, that are low on the ground in the front are uh, pulmonary. It's, a, it's a, called lungwort. It's not a native plant. 
these particular irises are Siberian irises. They're not native. I have native columbine growing in amongst these, but I also have domestic varieties of columbine. So I get a real sustained bloom and uh, the bright red, you see there was a dwarf, uh, dwarf azalea. You can probably pick out in the center of that picture to the right, there's a jack in a pulpit popping up through the hostas. The purplish ferns there are Japanese painted ferns, but I've also got purple leaved uh, uh, Labrador violets. What, what, I'm, what I want to make a point of is the diversity is wonderful because it, it creates visual interest all year long. Um, even in the winter, it, it, it's, it's interesting to look at the, what, what remains. Christmas fern being in there, I've, it's evergreen. Um, and we don't have to be purists. There's a lot of native plants in there too, but there are also non-native species because, you know, we're, uh, we're uh, I don't know, they, they all have their benefits. They fulfill a certain aesthetic. You know, you want to be able to enjoy it. You're planting it for yourself as well as for the insects too. So uh, just a case in point. And the other thing in here, what do I have? You can't see it. I've got black cohosh. Uh, there's a, an incredible variety of plants just in this small space. All right, let's move on to the next one, I guess. So it'd be better to show. This gives you an idea of, of where I am on the Pohat car. I've got a bridge, the only way to get to my house. And when I first came here, I knew I, would, I wanted to spend a lot of time. I spend a lot of time outside. So I want to create a living space that people can enjoy. Uh, and that, you know, I can go down and enjoy that. Um, and this, this stream floods and you'll see how it does that uh, shortly. But uh, with logs and things coming up, you know, and, and having to go th through this literal bottleneck on the stream, um, I started putting in the, the stone stonework and you don't have to be this elaborate, but what that prevents is erosion from walking and being there. Um, it prevents the, the compaction of the soil. I've got plants all through it. So it's not like a, uh, like a, a, a seawall or a concrete dike or anything. It's very permeable. I've got lots of plants growing up in between the rocks and it uh, gives you access to the stream without uh, creating the, the problems that would occur if, if they weren't there you know, in, in erosion. Um, but, so you can see the dam. Um, I've got shrubs and I've got a lot of, a lot of different native plants. If you look at the picture on the right, that's the walking from the roadway um, into my yard. And if you, you can see to the right, there's a hummingbird feeder. That's one of the things that really got me started uh, gardening the way I did uh, in selecting plants that were going to be attractive to hummingbirds because we had them in the area, they're attracted to water. Um, you can see I've got benches and, and tables there so that you can sit there and enjoy it further back just beyond that tree line. I've got a hammock, so it, it acts as a bird blind. You can, you can have it made in the shade. It's almost like a, uh, uh, a, a cave, I call it a cave. And uh, I've got a fire circle in the yard, so it's, I'm out there all times of the day. And it makes it very utilizable. Um, I've taught many kids how to fish, and this provides nice access for that. There are quite a few number of uh, children who caught their first fish here on my lawn. So, and, and once they enjoy the stream or, or in, enjoy, uh, learn something like fishing, you know, they're going to enjoy it for the rest of their lives too. Okay, next picture, I guess. Are there any questions along the way? I'd, I'd like to see if I'm, uh, I don't know, addressing what, what people are interested in. Um, the picture on the right is a, a close-up of, uh, of just one section of that stream that I've got. I've got yellow flag iris. Now, once again, yellow flag iris are not a native plant, but we find them commonly growing throughout the state of New Jersey because they were introduced a long time ago, um, and they're called like I said, ir iris pseudocorus, otherwise known as yellow flag iris. You see a little bit of blue in there, that's Amsonia. And that shrub 
uh, is a button bush. Button bush is a wonderful shrub. It's like, uh, it's a, it's very, very attractive. It gets these beautiful pom-pom like uh, blossoms on it that uh, just exude this sweet nectar that attracts butterflies. And it'll grow in standing water. I, you know, first encountered it in uh, swamps growing up out, out, of the, out of water. And this one's growing here in, in the stream and, and gets regularly flooded. Uh, the picture on the left um, is also along the edge of my property, but it's a, on a roadside swale with the water that comes off the mountain behind my house. It's always very damp or wet along this edge of the roadway, the way the water drains. And I just took this one picture of this one spot and it, you can see how thickly it's grown. There aren't too many quote weeds, meaning plants that are of no use to me. You see some grasses in there, but you, we, here we have the native uh, blue flag iris. We've got swamp milkweed. We've got uh, uh, touch me nots growing in here. I've got New York ironweed growing in here. I've got swamp mallow that's growing in here. Um, it's all good. And when you plant things uh, in mass or in, with, with a lot of diversity, everything fills in tightly. You don't have to, it, it really helps you with your maintenance. I don't really have to weed this garden. Occasionally I'll see some things in there, maybe an invasive that's, you know, decided to try to take root. And I sort of, uh, you know, stop that in, intention from, moving ahead but uh, a lot of uh, you don't have to you don't have to do a lot of weeding with native plants they'll, they'll take care of themselves if you plant enough of them so I, I want to encourage growth rather than worry about uh, doing a lot of weeding um, next picture I guess okay now you can see the areas that I would just tell you about that this is where it floods uh, this black on creek is a uh, very narrow valley and it floods very readily, very, very quickly um, because there's, there's not too much uh, bottom land around it to absorb this. It's like a funnel when, uh, when the water goes. Um, but you can see that these plants all come back even though it, it does flood because they're, uh, this is the type of environment they're used to. And uh, I end up not having a, too much erosion damage at all. Occasionally I'll get piles of, of sand that come and go, but uh, other than that, um, it holds up pretty well. While we're um, talking about edible plants, in the uh, picture on the left, there's that sort of clump of uh, plants sort of standing in the water there in, in the near foreground. That's actually a, a clethra shrub, a, a summer sweet clethra, which is a wonderful a, a plant that attracts uh, butterflies uh, and other uh, pollinating insects. They also, it also is wonderful to make a, a special kind of honey, clethra honey, uh, which is a very clear honey and has interesting properties. But there's a vine that's growing all over that and it's called American groundnut. And uh, it has edible tubers on it. And planted below that there's uh, camassia, which is a, a, a bulb-like plant um, not native to New Jersey, actually native to the Pacific Northwest, but it was the food plant that saved the Lewis and Clark expedition from starvation at one point, and that's growing there. So I plant plants for historical interest as well as aesthetic reasons. Um, the ground nut actually saved the pilgrims before they could plant their first uh, uh, crop of corn. They were uh, collecting ground nuts, which grow along uh, Cape Cod and the, the Atlantic seaboard too, that vine. Anyway, so uh, I guess we can move on. I don't know what else I've got. Let's see, I think that's it on, on your end. Um, I just had a couple of closing points um, before we move into like a discussion session. Um, uh, you know, I, I kind of, um, wanted to frame this presentation more from the beginner's standpoint and to kind of encourage people to really um, just get started and to dig in. Um, you know, I know um, sometimes when we start thinking about incorporating native plants um, into our gardening efforts, into our landscaping efforts, it can be overwhelming. 
Um, you know, there's a lot of information available and, you know, sometimes um, that can make it become a barrier to getting started on native plantings. Um, but um, I did want to um, just, you know, encourage you to, um, like we said, get to know your own property, um, start observing, you know, where you see these issues of erosion or flooding, um, let that guide you on your, on your plant decisions. Um, identify your own goals for um, any streamside landscaping or native plant um, gardening that you may um, endeavor. Um, so like, like we uh, highlighted many different types of pellets, these are, you know, these are interchangeable. You don't have to select one or the other, um, but, you know, identifying what you want out of your property can help you um, decide, you know, what you might uh, most enjoy. Um, of course, I encourage you to uh, visit a native plant nursery or a garden um, when you get started to provide some inspiration. Um, I have looked through a plethora of books, but nothing beats actually seeing um, some of these plants in person to get an idea of, you know, uh, their scale, um, what they look like throughout different seasons. Um, and you can consult help. There's many resources available to you. I'll talk about um, this in our next slide about, um, you know, how we can help at the MWA, but there are a number of resources um, to get started on this um, native plant endeavor. And then of course, you know, don't be afraid um, to experiment with native plants. Um, while there are some native plants that are um, very specific on their habitat requirements, many more of our native plants are quite forgiving. Um, you know, many times in my own gardening efforts, um, you know, I, I kind of just wing it. Um, to be honest, um, you know, not so much when it comes to work-related projects, but, you know, if I, if I see something interesting, I want to find a spot for it, you know, I will start there. Um, but many of our native plants are quite forgiving, um, and they're adapted to our climate, um, so they're oftentimes easier to work with than, um, you know, some non-native ornamental cultivars. Um, so those are my words of advice um, for starting your own native garden, especially in streamside plantings. Um, but like I said, um, MWA does actually have grant funding right now to provide a little bit of assistance to streamside landowners. Um, right now we are looking to partner with um, streamside landowners who would be willing to install a native riparian buffer. Um, in their own property. Um, so uh, we do have limited funds available um, to potentially assist um, with uh, uh, sourcing plants and installing plants, um, as well as plant protection. Um, through this program, we also have funding um, to provide guidance, um, you know, for streamside landowners on their um, plant selections. Um, and we are working to develop um, some materials around this uh, idea of different plant palettes to suit your landscape. Um, so if you are interested in you know, receiving further assistance or you, know, you just have questions about landscaping in your own property, um, feel free to reach out to me or, or Ryan um, on this project and we'd be happy to discuss further. Just a couple of other announcements. Um, I saw in the chat there was um, some interest in um, more edible landscaping talks. Um, so we actually do have a talk planned for April 26th. Um, so our water quality specialist, uh, she actually also um, is quite familiar with edible plants and foraging in the landscape. So she is going to be doing a talk on edible gardening and planting food forests in your yard that will tie in nicely to this topic if you have more interest in that. And then of course, MWA will be hosting um, its native plant sale again um, in May with the pickup um, May 7th. So just keep an eye out for information about putting in your order for that. 
So with that, I guess we can turn it over to questions. If there are any. Yeah, we'll give a, a few moments for everybody to come up with them, collect their thoughts. You can put it in the chat or you can um, raise your hand. You can unmute yourself and just ask a question. But I did want to just say thank you to Annie and, and Tomas for their presentations and for everybody's comments in the chat so far. Um, it's been very, uh, very informative. A lot of new plants that I've heard and uh, as a new native gardener myself, it's, it's very exciting. Um, I have a question from Caitlin. What's the most maintenance you've ever experienced after planting? So um, I will say it really depends on the existing um, conditions um, when you're when you're um, trying to plan for a riparian buffer planting. Oftentimes, um, in these riparian zone or streamside zones, there may be extensive issues with um, invasive species um, that need to be dealt with prior to trying to establish uh, new native. Um, plant species. So um, oftentimes that does require, um, you know, treating the area, um, trying to remove those invasive species up to two growing seasons prior to, you know, even trying to establish a buffer. Um, so the worst uh, case scenario I've experienced is trying to deal with Japanese knotweed. Um, if any of you have had the pleasure of experiencing Japanese knotweed. That is a very tough invasive plant to deal with. But, um, you know, if your landscape is, you know, maybe if it's just lawn area, um, it isn't subject to extensive um, invasive species that you need to deal with. Um, sometimes maintenance can actually be easier when you're utilizing native plants along these riparian areas. So, um, you know, if you ever had to try to mow along a stream bank or um, any area that gets wet, oftentimes um, it's just easier to utilize native plants in those areas. Um, you know, they can be lower maintenance than um, many native cultivars, so, or many uh, ornamental <laughs> species, sorry. I don't know if that answers the question. Oof. <laughs> Our next comment uh, is about, oh, <laughs> oh dear, it's about deer. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah, for those who don't live in like a well-developed neighborhood, um, what sort of measures or, or what, what do you do if you have a ton of deer? <laughs> yeah, so deer are tough. Um, you know, most, uh, most areas in Pennsylvania and New Jersey have an overpopulation of deer. So you will have to deal with extensive uh, deer pressure. And um, one of the issues oftentimes when we're planting shrubs or trees is that deer especially like those tender um, tops of trees and they can actually cause quite a bit of damage um, you know, eating your, your newly planted vegetation. So I actually did have a slide here showing some, uh, oops, the plant protection that we installed on, on this um, riparian buffer planting. So this planting was just uh, trees and shrubs. Um, you know, there is no perfect solution, but what we typically utilize um, for most trees is um, like a, this is plastic tree tube protection. Um, they, they are ventilated to um, provide airflow to the trees. They don't have issues with, um, you know, rot. Um, and they also oftentimes have a perforated seam so that, you know, when the tree does grow larger, um, it doesn't become girdled by, by the, the tree tube there, so that will that will, is designed to split over time. Um, the other option that I like to utilize for um, like more so shrubs is caging. Um, so you can install like um, welded wire cages 
around your trees. Um, this can get kind of pricey um, because typically, you know, we like to use something that's at least five feet tall. Um, but, you know, you can use things like chicken wire um, and that sort of thing as well. Um, I've also seen um, people experimenting with uh, deer fencing um, while, while these areas are becoming established. Um, but really, you know, you just need to get the trees and shrubs through that, that establishment period um, when dealing with deer. The other option that I'd like to talk about is being conscientious of the plants that you're selecting. So there are many um, native species that are more deer resistant than others. Um, I'll go back to spice bush. This is one of my favorite plants to include in buffer plantings, kind of in mass because um, it is very deer resistant um, and it grows fairly well. So, um, you know, while I do encourage uh, obviously diversity. Um, sometimes I do try to um, incorporate more of these deer resistant plants um, just so that, you know, you still, even if a couple of trees don't make it, you still have backup. I saw that, uh, see, oh, I think she's gone. <laughs> Somebody had their hand up, but it looks like they're not here anymore. Um, yeah, and I'll just say uh, I have the same concern with rabbits um, just because that's the herbivore um, that terrorizes my plants. Um, and I think that makes it a little bit tougher because you're talking about smaller flowers and, and you know, do you really want to put a fence around your garden when part of the point of a garden is to look nice and, and pretty? So um, most, most native plant nurseries uh, we'll have the knowledge, if not outright advertising, which plants are deer resistant, uh, which plants are, are good for surviving or just repelling species that might otherwise uh, graze on, on your, favorite, your favorite plants. Yeah, and that's something too that, you know, we're trying to incorporate into um, the guidance materials that we're developing as part of this program. Um, is providing information on which uh, native species may be deer resistant. Uh, let's see, and someone has a comment about um, swamp loose strife, Dakotan verticillatus, along mm -hmm. the river above Lake Muskinekong. Um, I admit I only know purple loose strife, which I believe is invasive. So I'm assuming. Yeah, no, swamp loose strife is one. a native. It, swamp loose strife is a native plant. It's actually. Um, it's very beautiful, um, has beautiful fall color, um, kind of turns like this golden color. Um, but it looks it looks pretty different from the purple loose strife that you know you may be familiar with. But it is another good repairing plant. Uh, another another comment from from Anne being on the shores of Lake Muskinekong, having that personal experience of encouraging people to plant buffers, um, but then landowners wanting easy access to the water and, and mowing right up to the edge. Yeah. It, it is a challenge balancing um, human enjoyment with, with lake health or, or water quality for um, rivers as well. Um, Got to imagine there's some kind of in-between. Um, and that's kind of what we're, we're trying to get at with, with some of these projects that we're undertaking. Yeah. Yeah, I think, um, you know, for to in order to expand, um, you know, repairing buffer areas, um, we need to be mindful of how people are enjoying their their spaces and work with them to, um, you know, find some low impact alternatives um, to enjoying like their waterfront properties. So, um, you know, like, Tomas had with, you know, the small area that was, um, he had the stone um, to enjoy the waterfront area. Um, you know, you don't have to completely mow an entire stream bank to have access to it and to enjoy it. Um, I've also seen um, uh, buffer plantings that are more like a meadow that um, people have 
um, purposely created pathways and walkways through those areas. Um, and they, you know, that's, that's part of their daily routine is taking a walk through those, um, those paths that they've created out of this um, streamside meadow. So. Yeah, and I'll just say this, of course, depends on how much uh, waterfront you have, but if you have a, a large frontage on a lake or on a river, you can maintain access to that water body while still filling in some of that bank so that you have a walking path or a path for you to drag your canoe down there or get to your dock, whatever it might be. It could just be planting some of that bank while leaving a smaller uh, piece of it open. Um, and, you know, I assume, Anne, that since you're on Lake Muskinetcon, this is probably not news to you, but, you know, another talking point that relates to mowing right up to the edge and fertilizing it is the issue of harmful algal blooms. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people already realize, but some may not, that the fewer native plants you have, um, the more nutrients and, and fertilizers are going to run off into these water bodies and, and further contribute to harmful algal blooms. So some of these, these buffer plantings, these strips of vegetation that have deeper root systems that slow down the water, um, those can actually help mitigate and help uh, lessen the severity of these, these algal blooms. So. Hi. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Everybody near lakes, especially North Jersey, are, are talking about uh, HABs, harmful algal blooms right now. Um, I, I did have a question because when thinking about the root systems and, and erosion, um, I guess it depends on the particular vegetation, but how long after planting will you gain that erosion protection benefit? I mean, how long does it take for some of these roots to get deep enough to the point where it's not like the turf grass where chunks of bank are just right. falling into the river. Um, you know, it can take several years um, for, uh, you know, the woody species to really um, establish and take root. Um, what I like um, to encourage people thinking about is, you know, especially right alongside those stream banks, you know, providing a diversity of um, plants that some may establish more quickly than others. So um, the, oftentimes the long-term goal, especially for right up against a stream is to have more shrubbery and more trees um, because you know, you can, those, those woody roots can really knit together those banks tightly and help prevent stream bank erosion. Um, but you know, thinking about your understory and um, you know, maybe some native uh, grasses um, that can be planted in between um, to more quickly establish is something important to think about. So um, some other like quicker, um, maybe cheaper options too are to consider um, live stake plantings right along the banks of the stream. So we didn't get into this and I hope um, to maybe do this as a demonstration for a future river talk is um, how to go about live stake planting. So many native um, uh, shrubs, they actually, um, you can take cuttings of them and they will uh, regrow from just the cutting. So, you know, it's a simple, pretty much as simple as um, taking a cutting of that and sticking those live stakes into the banks. Um, so many willow species establish quite quickly this way and can be a cheap alternative to get that, um, that density um, that we're looking for, for protecting our banks. Yeah, I think, you know, it all depends on, on, on the urgency. There may be a situation where the erosion really needs sort of a, sort of a drastic uh, mm -hmm. engineering to sort of do it. I mean, you could use, you know, the various kinds of mesh that are uh, used just to hold the soil in place until you get a root system going. Yeah. But that's, yeah, that's we a didn't, whole different level of engagement. The, yeah, uh, we didn't really talk 